Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Before we start with the, I mean, the conversation with Ivan Krastev, just want to tell all of you what you may want to know, just because the first exit polls came from the German elections. Uh, the CDU is ahead, uh, as expected, with 33.5%. Uh, SPD with 21%, the worst uh, result ever. AfD on third place with 13%, uh, and uh, the FDP with 10, and the Greens and the Linke, I think, both with 9. So it's um, within the range of expectations, um, and certainly uh, something new in Europe to have now in Germany, also a right wing populist party, and one that is. Uh, has a particularly nasty streak, uh, will change uh, the, 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 the atmosphere and the debate uh, also probably in the coming years. And uh, it may be the, the best overture for a talk about the unmaking of the liberal, of the liberal revolution uh, when you hear this result. Um, so I'm welcoming Ivan Krastev, political scientist born in Bulgaria, uh, today one of the leading European uh, public intellectuals uh, who has been living in Vienna for the last few years. He's the chairman of the Center for Liberal Strategies in Sofia, a permanent fellow at the Institute for Human Science in Vienna, a founding board member of the European Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, I could go on and on and on on the list. Uh, to sum it up, an expert on virtually everything between Lisbon and Vladivostok. Uh, so everything you want to know, uh, just ask Ivan. Uh, I've been practicing this for a couple of years and now I can have the next hour or at least part of this hour to do the same and I'm looking forward to it. Um, the last book you just published, uh, the essay called After Europe or Europa Dämmerung in German, uh, and as the title suggests, it's quite pessimistic on the prospects of the EU and the whole European idea. And in it you say the biggest threat to the European model is migration. Uh, why is that? So let's start first with softening my pessimistic stand, uh, saying that it's a national feature. There was a poll being done in the world and it appeared that the Bulgarians are most pessimistic when you compare to the GDP. To the extent that the title in The Economist was The Optimist, The Pessimists and The Bulgarians. So from this point of view, you probably should be less worried. But moving uh, to Vienna certainly yeah. didn't help, did it? <laughs> yeah, the original title of the book in the way I suggested to the publishing house was perhaps Burke. Uh, but then the American publisher said, perhaps Burke probably means something in Vienna but nothing in the United States. And because it was uh, an English language publication, it landed after Europe. But basically my argument is a much simpler one. Uh, and. It starts with the fact that European Union in the last several years went through four very important, profound and shaping crises. One was the financial crisis of 2009, 2009-2010. Uh, uh, and then you have the Brexit and you have the Russia-Ukrainian crisis and then you have migration. So in a strange, war, be, uh, in a strange way, European Union was dancing with crisis. The problem is out of this crisis, which one you are going to take home? And my claim is that in a way, the migration crisis is going to have the most profound impact because it is affecting the nature of the domestic politics in the way none of the other crises are doing this, including in countries in which you don't have a single immigrant. So from this point of view, uh, strangely enough, the refugee crisis of 2015 played the same role that 9-11 played for the United States. It is not the number of the people. Listen, 3,000 people dying is a tragedy, but there are much more people dying in the world on different crises, but it pushed the Americans to re-perceive the world in which they are living. Certain things ended in the way the Americans were seeing the world. The same happened. For Europe. With the refugee crisis, we in a certain way ended to see the world in a way we're doing this and we discovered something which is very obvious and it was not a secret before but now it became politically obvious for everybody. 
in a world with such a big social and economic differences and so interconnected world. If you want to change your life, better change the country in which you live than change the government which is governing you. If you are living in a poor country somewhere in Africa and you really want a radical change in one generation, migration is a much more radical option than any type of a political revolution. And what I claim in the book is that migration is the 21st century version of the revolution. The difference is that it's not a collective action anymore. It's mm -hmm. the individuals, it's the families, they go, but as a result of it, European Union starts to work as a counter-revolutionary power because they come to us, and basically our political communities is asking the questions, what is going to happen to our institutions? Yes you start to have a lot of fears, which also have been very much also fueled by the politicians and others, but some of these fears are real. And one of the most under-discussed fear is the demographic anxiety. I'm always giving Bulgaria an example because in Bulgaria we don't have refugees. At the end of the day, there are less than 1,000 people. So you cannot say that uh, what people experience is based on the fact that they have been flooded by people. This is not Greece, where you really have a lot of people. It's not Italy. But what happened is that in the last 25 years after the opening of the wall, around 2 million Bulgarians left the country, living somewhere in Europe or the United States, which means that country that was around 9 million is now 7.2 million, very much aging, shrinking, and according to the projections of the UN, in the next 20 years, we're going to lose 27% of our population. And then when you see all these people coming to Europe, the major question for an ordinary Bulgarian living somewhere in the countryside is, is there going to be anybody in the next 100 years reading Bulgarian, speaking Bulgarian? Uh, so from this point, if you certain small ethnic nations discover their mortality. And as a result of it, you have a really genuine existential reaction, which is not correlated with economic problems. By the way, the more you talk about migration in economic terms, the more people are becoming nervous. This is not connected with the difference between political parties. If there is any consensus in our societies, and this is true, it's very much on this. And this, in my view, creates a huge problem because also it's very much return the East-West divide. Uh, because here is one of the major differences between Eastern Europe and Western Europe. And I know that there are much more factors, but I'm just going to give you three in order to go. The first is, East European countries do not have colonial history. For us, Africa or Asia are just chapters in the geography textbook. It's not that none of us have been there during the communist period. There was a lot of kind of a experts going and trying to remake these countries, but we don't have the feeling that our fate is connected with these societies in the way the French or the Brits or others, we don't have diasporas there uh, in our countries from these places. Secondly, if you see the legacy of 1968, 1968 in Western Europe was very much identifying with people who are not like you. It was very much rediscovering the third world. It was basically talking about decolonization. For Central and Eastern Europe, 1968 was about national awakening. Anti-communism of 1968 was very much about the struggle for national sovereignty. It was a Mitskevich place in Poland. It was not kind of a universal thing that brought the students on the, uh, 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 on the streets. And thirdly, this is the failure of East European societies to do with some of their minorities and to integrate them that make the public extremely skeptical to our capacity to integrate. Listen, what is happening to the Roma communities in Central and East European countries? The failure to integrate these people, uh, the way that the general public's resenting, resentment of general public is so high, so you cannot expect any in Central and Eastern Europe to say, we can do it. Because if we can do it, why we didn't do it for people that have been living with us forever? So I do believe some of this makes the migration crisis so important, and this is not by accident 
that uh, alternative for Germany is doing better than many people expected. Because if you listen to the German elections, and I was in Germany uh, uh, last week basically traveling the country, you are not going to see immigration much during the television debates. But the moment when you go and start talking to the local politicians and others, they said this was the issue number one that, that voters have been discussing. Yeah. And I think just in Germany, just like what you said, is the, 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 the I don't know the exact breakdown of where the AFD got its most votes, but probably in East Germany, where the, lead, where the fewest refugees have, have also settled of the, of, of the last wave. So it's also similar to Absolutely. the East European countries and, and, you know, and uh, xenophobia without many, too, 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 many, too many foreigners. Uh, this is yes. also very, it's exactly, because I was to Leipzig and some other places. And the interesting story is how through the migration crisis, the problem of the reunification came back. You're talking to people who are telling me, they told us, to integrate the Syrians, why they don't integrate us first. Mm -hmm. uh, and this talk about East Germans who believes that they were much more colonized and so on and so on, you cannot agree and disagree, but this course came very strongly on this. And paradoxically from outside, particularly from the United States, people are going to say this was the decision of the Chancellor Merkel to open the border and she won the elections, which means that migration is not a problem. But the truth is that one of the reasons the Chancellor is going to be re-elected is that she opened the border, but also she showed capacity to close the borders. Yeah. And this was coming very much with some of the electorate of the, uh, of the conservative parties saying at least, and this is interesting, they said we showed compassion we also showed that there are limits to what we can do. And it was her capacity, basically, to do it that makes them legitimate, uh, uh, and this is what got, in my view, her re-elected. I mean, the way that the, the whole the question of refugees and East Central European countries was perceived here in Austria was, um, there was the, uh, the there, there was the search for a European solution. There was this decision to resettle 160,000 refugees from Greece and Italy, and there was a strong, loud no <coughs> from virtually all East Europeans, which has gone all the way to the European Court. And a lack of understanding here: how can these countries be so ungrateful? How can they be so non-solidaric when they have profited so much from from, from European solidarity in in, in the past? Uh, was there a was there a lack of was there too little understanding of the psyche of the of the of the, of the, of the feelings among among our neighbors and was it perhaps a mistake even to make us to, to, to have a European decision against the will of some country saying you have to take even a handful of refugees against your will you know it, it's extremely tricky because some very ni nasty things have been done in Central and Eastern Europe particularly on the level how we talked, because this is one thing to say that we cannot do something. It's totally different to criminalize people who are running for their life. But there was also situation is not as simple as many in the West are trying to present. From the central and distant European point of view, German government, which during the financial crisis was saying rules, 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 European Union is a space of rules. This is not about moral arguments and compassion unilaterally they decided to break the rules. This is a factual stuff. And then Central Europeans, particularly part of the Central Europeans elite, went panicking because they said, listen, if they're not going to ask us about migration, of what else they're not going to ask us? Is it going to be Germany taking all decisions and they expect from us simply to follow? The scandal was, that all this kind of a resistance, which was very much resistance to the way the decision was taken, first it was unfair because there was not a German plan. Now there is this famous book uh, uh, published in Germany trying to show how the decision had been taken, which shows that it was really response to crisis and it was a day-to-day -day decision making. So there was not Merkel plan to do this or that. But Central Europeans, we did it on a language which was very difficult to be defended. And secondly, we are talking about a number of people, the settlement quotas are so low that nobody can say these people has a legitimate argument. We are talking about 1,300 people in Hungary. Nevertheless, 
how sensitive you are, nobody can convince me that Hungary cannot take care of 1,300 people. So from this point of view, I do believe that Central European governments were going to have a very strong argument if they have said, listen, we are going to get this settlement, we are going to get these quotas because we care about these people, but do you know what? We are not going to tolerate any more this type of a decision making when the rules are broken. But they didn't do it. And they didn't do it for a very obvious reason. If you go on the opinion polls for the last 10 years, you're going to see one important difference between East and West, particularly between North, to be honest, not East, West, but North and East. In countries like Germany, Sweden, Austria is the same. Always people had more trust in their national government than in the European institution. The idea was we trust Europe because also we trust our government to influence it. In places like Bulgaria, Hungary, Poland, but also Italy, Greece, there was always higher trust in European institution than in our national government. And the logic was also clear. We don't know what they're doing in Brussels, but they cannot be worse than our own. It was the fact that we very well knew our own that basically pushed it. This changed during the migration crisis because the logic was, do you know what? Probably our elites are more corrupt, but they care about us more than those in Brussels. Has the migration crisis made uh, politics in East, East, East Central European countries less liberal? Has it strengthened the illiberal forces? Is it one of the explanations why Orban, Kaczynski and others are flying high and the, the liberals are on the defensive? No, first, in order to, to make uh, it very clear, there is a consensus among the Central European political parties on the refugee and the migration. There are different language on which, for example, Donald Tusk is going to disagree with the way Mr. Kaczynski is going to disagree, but when it comes to limiting migration, there is not a major substantial difference. Uh, and I do believe this is quite important because one of the things that happened, I don't believe that migration crisis is going to explain why certain governments have been elected or not, but migration crisis made, gave the ultimate argument for people to explain to the these people voting for, for these parties, why they don't accept the status quo and some of uh, the liberal order in the way it was described. Because if you go even on a philosophical level, liberalism has a huge problem with migration. I was rereading Fukuyama's famous article, not the book, but the article, The End of History. And this is quite important to reread. Because the first time when you're reading, you're reading in order to see what is in. When you're reading normally, you're going to see what is lacking. So Fukuyama, 1989, writing a lot about the world in which they're going, free movement of ideas, free movement of capital, free movement of goods. There is only one thing that was not moving in the article, and this was people. The word migration is absent from the article. Strangely enough, the idea was that they're going to be the world in which everything else is going to move, but people are going to stay in their places. And this is quite important because in order for the liberal promise, which is very much rooted in the Enlightenment, in order to function, there are two options. Either we have rights simply because we're human being. And from this point of view, my rights are not coming from my passport. I have my rights nevertheless where I am because I'm a citizen of the world, not because I'm a Bulgarian citizen. Or the other option is, and then everybody can move and go where he wants and, or she wants and she can do what she wants. The other option is that the world is going to be populated by such a beautiful states that nobody's going to be interested to leave them. And as you know, both of these are very difficult to be realized. At least at the present moment, I don't see how it is happening. Uh, so one of the major things that is taken for granted in any democracy is what are the borders of the political community. The border between citizens and non-citizens is the most protected border in any political democracy, who votes, who does not vote. And as a result of it, what we saw as the result of the migration crisis is that it's not that there are not democracies in Central and Eastern Europe anymore. The problem is that before, democratic institutions were inclusive. They were trying to get people in. 
Now this same institution became exclusive. They're trying basically to get people out. And as a result of it, one historian said it that probably the period between 1989 and 2015 could be remembered as the interwall period. Uh, you have now a genuine push to build borders, not only physical borders, trade borders, information borders, and others. And this border building is coming through democratic means. This is what some people are kind of lacking. It's not simply, this is the voters insisting on this. Well, there has been another uh, breakdown of borders, which has been the borders within the European Union, uh, which allowed the free movement of people and free movement of labor within the EU, from which East European countries have, have benefited a lot. They have taken enormous advantage of it. Um, don't, are, they, are they also, don't they see the, con the connection between the two? Are they not afraid maybe that building, starting to build walls will also lead to, uh, will, will also lead to other walls, maybe between, the, between Hungary and the Austrian, Austrian labor market? Uh, I, I have this in the book because I'm going to quote this because I love it. There is a beautiful novel by Jose Saramago called Death with Interruptions. And it tells the story of a society in which suddenly people stop dying. In January, nobody died. In February, nobody died. In March, nobody died. And there was a huge euphoria. Nobody's dying. And then certain metaphysical nervousness came. First was the insurance companies. They said, if nobody dying, we are dying. And then came the church. If nobody dying, nobody can be resurrected. And then basically, people that have been taking care of a very sick old people, then understood that till, till ever they're going to be in this situation. So a kind of a criminal network was created to smuggle old and sick people out of the country so they can die in the neighboring country. At the end of the book, the prime minister goes to the king and said, your majesty, if we don't start dying, we do not have future. I'm saying this because you have something that is the best that turns out to be the worst. Something like opening of the borders for Central Europe is this is what happened. And you're going to be surprised, but in many Central and East European countries, what is in question now in a big way is not the migrants that we don't want to come. We started to be very critical of the effect of the opening of the borders after 1989 on our societies and economies. And let's give you an example. People living, I'm here, I very much benefit from this. But when you have two million Bulgarians living in the country, three important things are happening. For many people who are still living there, the very fact that they are there is perceived as failure. If everybody wants to live, do you remember GDR? What was the problem of the GDR? That everybody wants to live. There was the old joke, Mr. Honecker, when you're living class, please switch off the light. Uh, the, the basic problem, the value of the place is diminished because everybody wants to leave it. Secondly, what is happening is many people are saying, oh, how it is important uh, that you have such a bad governments in these countries. Listen, this is the missing voters. The people that can make the change have decided not to voice but to exit in Hirschman term. And thirdly, strangely enough, even in financial terms, people have been very much benefiting, the money that are coming and so on, but then economically they said, listen, we're getting money from the West, but on the same way, is it not that we are also subsidizing Germany? We are putting all this money in our education system, but the better we are educating our kids, the easiest for them is to find a job in Germany. So in a certain way, we are subsidizing Germany. Uh, I'm saying this because this conversation is not going to be there five years ago. Five years ago, people are going to see only the positive side of the opening of the borders. And now there is a very strong focus on what we are losing. And part of the problem of the transition period is that we always was talking about the change as a win-win change. And this is not a new phenomenon. Do you remember how people in the rural areas have been basically experiencing the big move to the cities in 60s and 70s. 
And you have the same type of a feeling in many Central and East European countries. And just one fact for you. Normally, people are going to say that all these people living is very much correlating with failure of the economies and so on. Do you know this is not true? The countries in which you have the highest percent of the people living are the Baltic countries. Up to 10% of the population of places like Lithuania or Estonia has left in the last 10 years. These countries are not doing badly economically. So for the re people are living for different reasons. Part of it is curiosity. You want to have a different experience. Not everything can be reduced only to the economic factors. But imagine for these very small nations of two, three million people seeing 10% of the dead population living. I have a beautiful joke, Bulgarian, to tell you about this. Seven people dressed like a Japanese samurai. Four people like, dressed like a Japanese samurai are walking on the street of Sofia. And the bystander looked at them and said, who are you? They said, we're the seven samurai. And what are you doing here? We are here to make this place a better place. But why are you only four? The other three are working abroad. Uh, so you have this type of effect of the always missing three. Um, when, when you talk about the unmaking of the liberal revolution, do you mostly mean the building of wars and the loss of this ideal of liberal, the liberalism in terms of open borders and open movements? Or is there also a loss of internal liberalism? Of, uh, of free speech, uh, press freedom, um, t um, tolerance and acceptance of people who are different. Are we seeing a decline of, of, our, of these liberal values also on the continent? Sure. Not only. I'm going to make after that the point because I don't believe that the making of the liberal orders is taking place in Central Europe, only in Europe. I do believe we're talking about a much global phenomena. But one of the major paradox of the globalization is that the more we are interconnected, the better we know each other, the more I'm afraid that what is totally disappearing is universal ideas and the trust in the universal institutions. And I'm going to give you my favorite example with a very particular institution. Listen, one of the most Catholic places in Europe is Poland. And you know the position of the Pope on migration. Does it affect the Poles at all? No. Why? Because in a certain way what we see is in a nationalization of the churches. For them, being a Catholic means to be a good Pole. And the same in other places. This is much more typical for the Orthodox Christianity. For us, this is not, to be honest, a news. We have been like traditionally developed like this. Uh, I'm saying this because paradoxically, all major universalist positions are highly weakening. Look, look, look what is happening to the internationalist left. I cannot see them. Where are they? So from this point of view, paradoxically, the globalization left you a major crisis of universalism, of understanding of the mankind as a whole. And probably here is the paradox. The biggest universalist, Immanuel Kant, was famous for the fact that he's never leaving his small town. Probably it's easier to be a universalist when you don't know others. Uh, now when we basically started to know each other, what comes much more is the problem of differences. Uh, and this is why we see a kind of a rise of a global identity politics. Identity politics everywhere. But uh, we are, in my view, failing to understand that I'm going now to give Central and Eastern Europe. Listen, part of the problem with Central and Eastern Europe is that we try to explain everything through the communist legacy. Everything which is happening in our country should be perceived as very specific. Unfortunately, it's not very specific. Uh, imagine two historians, one who is going to write the history of the period between 1918 and 1939, and he's writing his book on January 1939. So he's going to write the history as the post-war period, post-World War I. And his interest is going to be totally focused on what France did, what Great Britain did, I mean the countries that make 
uh, the post-war order. And imagine the same history being written by a historian, certain type of a profile of a historian, but written on January 1st, 1946. For him, this same period is going to be the pre-war period, leading to the Second World War. And he's going to be interested in totally different things, Germany, Stalin, Soviet Union, and so on. I do believe that when I say that something is changing is that we're changing the way we see certain things. We see this type of a change. I was very carefully looking to the rhetoric of three very different people who in a very different way have been experiencing the 20, last 25 years. Russian President Mr. Putin, Hungarian Prime Minister Mr. Orban, American President Donald Trump. The interesting story is that liberal order is not collapsing simply because you have the rise of revisionist powers. It is collapsing, collapsing also because the order setters, the United States itself, and their new president is saying, American world does not work well for the United States. And the key word that all of them are using is victory. Mr. Trump talks about victory. President Putin talks about victory. Mr. Orban talks about victory. There was, the liberal world was always perceived as a win-win situation in which probably you're not gaining much, but you are not losing much. In a certain way, you're never losing much and forever. The problem is that this type of a liberalism created a problem of identity. Victory and defeat create identity. Defeat because it creates the idea of revenge. Victory because it creates this idea we have been victorious over them. And you have this strong push for political regimes that are giving a very strong identity to their citizens, but the result of it is that it is us versus them. This is the return of a very Schmittian understanding of politics where it is enemy-friend relationship. So the last, the last uh, uh, defenders of this liberal order are sitting in Brussels, uh, now in Paris with Macron, Angela Merkel in, 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 in Berlin. Uh, can they, at least within their own European realm, can they maintain this idea of a win-win situation and that, uh, that this is the, that, that the common interest is, 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 dom is, is dominant against the uh, uh, narrow national interest? Or is, it also, is this also something, is this also under threat? No, I do believe that Europe, if they're going to be a total collapse of disorder, the biggest loser is going to be Europe. America can function as a big illiberal state. China can do it and doing it. Russia can do it to a certain extent. Uh, for the European Union being composed of very small nation states, which in the present world cannot much compete of their own, uh, in a certain way, the preservation of the European Union is the precondition for Europeans playing any role in the world. So from this point of view, I do believe there is a much more rationale, and this crisis probably is going to play differently, but here comes the problem. And the problem is that what we see in Europe, people like to talk about crisis of democracy and so on. European Union never was a classical democratic project. It's fine, because the idea of the European demos was always problematic. Uh, this is something that has been discussed many times. What is really in crisis, in my view, in Europe is the crisis of meritocratic version of society. Look at the people in Brussels, classical meritocratic elites. Listen, most of these people are coming from a quite humble background. I mean, senior, we're talking about senior bureaucrats. We're not talking about commissioners and so on. Most of these people made their career by good education, they were acting according to the rules, and at least from my Bulgarian perspective, they're not particularly corrupt people. I have seen more corrupt people in different places. Why then they're so mistrusted by the national publics? And I'm going to give you four reasons why people are not wrong to believe that there is something problematic. First, meritocratic society makes very clear the difference between winners and losers. Because for the meritocrats, society is like school. You go, the exams. Some people are doing the exams, some people are failing on the exams. And those who are doing well on the exams have no reason to feel sorry for those who failed because it was their failure. 
So in a meritocratic society, you want losers to own their failure. By the way, here comes the populists, and they said, society is not a school, it's a family. I'm going to help you not because you deserve it, but because you are one of us. Secondly, meritocratic elites are very mobile. What people really hate, to be honest, in places like Bulgaria, about the European Union is that imagine that you have a minister that you very much dislike. You want him in jail. But when you're voting him out, voting him out, he doesn't end up in jail, he ends up in Brussels. And he ends up with a better salary. And this you hate because you don't have the feeling that you have control over him. And this huge mobility uh, creates the situation in which you look at these people and say, do you know what? In a moment of crisis, they're going to leave and I'm going to stay. In Bulgaria 10 years ago, not speaking a foreign language was an advantage if you want to go into electoral politics. People are going to put in their CV, I speak four languages, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. These days, not speaking a foreign language helps because there is no way for you to go anywhere. You're going to stay. And staying with the people in the time of crisis is quite important because one of the weak port, uh, points of meritocracy is that you believe that competence is the only thing that matters. But look who are the most respected elites these days, both in democratic and not democratic countries. See who Trump put in his administration, generals. If it was in the Russia, we're going to say that this is the rise of Siloviki. Why? Because the military elites are the ones that you see as sacrificing their lives. They're the ones that can, are not mobile. It's not easy to move from the American army to the Russian army. It's easy with the bankers. Uh, so from this point of view, you have the feeling that they stay for something. And I do believe this is the problem for people like Macron and Chancellor Merkel and so on. Uh, in order, to get Europeans to stand behind the European project, they should show that in this project we are together. And of course, here is going to come also some of the problem with this renationalization of politics, because, and this is a point which I was making in the book, there is one major psychological difference between Eastern Europe and Western Europe, which in my view is not discussed enough. In the East, all of us, have the experience of a collapse of a major political system as a personal experience. Some of us liked it a lot, but it does not mean that you are not shocked how quickly this can happen. Believe me, in Bulgaria in the 1980s, communism was as stable as nature. I knew how I'm going to retire in the communist system. Some people like it, some people dislike it. But even people who have been resisting and opposing it were shocked how easily something so powerful till yesterday can disintegrate. As a result of it, East European leaders, and I'm talking now about democratic leaders with a strong anti-communist credentials, because Mr. Kaczynski, we can like or dislike what we, he's doing. Listen, nobody can question his credentials in the pre-1989, like many of the people of his parties. They were in prison in the same way the liberals like Michnik and others were. So this is not basically accidental people, but they fear that European Union is very fragile. As a result of it, you start hedging. If you believe that something like this can happen, you start to take policy decisions that are going to help you to be in a better position nevertheless of what happens integration or disintegration. I don't believe that there is a serious East European leader who is in favor of the disintegration of the European Union. East Europeans, we are strange people, but we are not idiots. So from this point of view, there is no East European who believes that his country is going to do better out of the EU. What exactly Bulgaria is going to flourish after the, out of the EU? But the fear that if something goes wrong, we should be prepared is pushing people to do this. In Western Europe, it's different. Your generation of West Europeans does not have this type of a crisis experience. You have the experience of crises that have been always overcome. 1970s, 1980s, and I found this very interesting when you talk with the colleagues, which basically you have the same analysis of the situation, and you can see that 
East Europeans were much more nervous. I was talking to, uh, to, the, uh, to the president of the Union, Donald Tusk, before the American elections. It was this and that, and he told me, you know that Trump is going to win. And I said, I have the same feeling. And he was strongly for, for Hillary, so it's not that he wanted. Because the idea is, when something goes wrong, it goes wrong. Uh, and I do believe this different psychological predisposition is going to be very important. Okay. And this is why for people like, I do believe that the Chancellor, being East European herself, is probably better prepared to understand this. When I was listening to President Macron in his first tour about Central and Eastern Europe, he is not getting right some of the sources of the nervousness of the people. Mm -hmm. okay. I would like to offer you the opportunity to ask short questions or give very short statement and ask you to keep it short so we have enough time to get the answer from Ivan Krastev, please. Hello. Um, in your book, After Europe, you mention that, <coughs> excuse me, you mentioned that referendums are one of the biggest threats for the European Union and that the biggest success of the European Union would be to survive all the challenges of migration, referendums, and all that. Um, what specifically in the nature of a referendum makes it so threatening? Thank you very much. Uh, uh, and the, for me, this important question, to be honest, I'm not talking about the Brexit type of referendums. Brexit type of referendum is a very legitimate one. Are you staying in or out? It's something that political community should decide. But there is one major characteristic of the European Union that makes European Union very different than any nation state. And this is that it's a negotiating space. The biggest problem of the referendums is that they cannot negotiate with each other. A referendum is a final statement. If I'm going to organize in Bulgaria a referendum on something, and people are going to make their decision, when I go to Brussels, I cannot renegotiate this position. So imagine that different member states starts to come with a referendums on different issues. And they're going to come with a different final decisions. Then the very space of European politics is impossible. So my argument is you can be strongly for or against referendums, and on the level of the nation state, I can see some of the advantages of the referendum politics. If it comes to the nation states like this, national democracies, I'm not a great fan, but I'm not going to feel uh, so much worried. When it comes to the European Union, exactly because European Union is not a republic, I do believe that allowing people to vote on the policies which affect the Union as a whole is a recipe for paralyzing the Union. And just to give you one example, we know, I have been studying Soviet disintegration and the Yugoslav disintegration, and Ivan Vevod is here, and he has been writing and knows much more about uh, the Yugoslav one. All of them go through the referendum stage. And do you know where is the paradox? In March 1991, very few of you remember, there was a referendum in nine of the Soviet republics in favor or against the preservation of the Soviet Union. In all these nine, the pro-Soviet majority prevailed. But this wave of referendum was one of the ways to de-legitimize the Soviet Union because six referendums decided, six republics decided not to have a referendum. And the result of it is that the national republics overnight turned to be the place where the future of the Union should be decided. So the fact that they have a majority didn't help them several months later. I'm saying this because for domestic political reasons, leaders are very easy these days to go on the referendum because referendum is the best way to run away of responsibility. Some of these referendums are offending in the way you're treating citizens. In Netherlands, there was a referendum on the treaty between European Union and Ukraine, the trade treaty. Believe me, there are not more than 40 persons in the country that have read this treaty of 400 pages, which is totally technical and does not affect much the way the Dutch society functions. So it was a proxy referendum in order to show that people does not like how European Union works or how Brussels works and so on. As a result of it, very few people voted. 
less than, I do believe, around 30%. So then you want the decision of 16% or 17% of the Dutch to predetermine the relations of the European Union with Ukraine. Can you imagine that tomorrow if Bulgarians are going to do this and so on on a common policy, how you're going to have a legitimate decision making. So this is why on the level of the EU, I do believe that the referendums are an issue, particularly these small referendums which are tactically used to block the process. Okay. Thank you. Hi. I'd like to explain the argument you made earlier about uh, Eastern and Central European countries. Um, uh, subsidizing the Germany and the Western countries with, with, uh, with young people uh, in terms of because they are working uh, elsewhere, they are also not supporting the social system, um, which I think uh, is, a, is a crucial part of any, uh, like if you, you have a state, then the solidarity means also the social system, which I think basically is also, I mean, May, might be the, the goal of the European Union. Is there a will to make to finalize it and make the fiscal union and the social and to unionize the social system in foreseeable future? Listen, this is a great example because we like to talk about solidarity mainly as an emotional state. Uh, and if you try to define solidarity simply in these this terms, you're going to discover that solidarity on the level of the European Union is very difficult to be sustained if you believe that it is going to be driven simply uh, by the emotions of the people. Because there is a lot of psychological studies that show two things. There are two groups with which you're much more ready to have solidarity than any other. Either your own community or the most vulnerable people. Imagine that you have five euros and you have three options to whom to give this as an individual. One is a kids in Africa that have nothing to eat. The second is your neighbor, which has this problem and you know him personally. And the third is a Greek. The percent of those who are going to give it to the Greek is not very high. So from this point of view, it's institutional solidarity that was critical for the European Union and this transfer of money was critical. But what you're saying is exactly at the point. When young people are living, the pension system in Central and Eastern Europe start to be very weak. You have these pensioners who are receiving private money from their kids working abroad, but they're not going to get anything from the state. So the loyalty to the state is totally collapsing. And the idea is, can you have a certain type of insurance on the level of the union, being a pensioners and so on. Can you have this type of redistribution? Uh, but at the same time, it's very difficult because in order for this to happen, you need voter support. And one of the problems with the democracies in European Union, but particularly these days in Central and Eastern Europe is that unlike in 1968, the younger generation is a small demographic cohort. There are not many of them. I mean, electorally speaking, they don't matter electorally. I can win the elections in any of these countries, focusing on the retired people. They're much more ready to vote. It's much more easy to be mobilized. And as a result, this explains why you have so many young people on the streets protesting for this or that in Central and Eastern Europe. Because the street is the only place where you can get political visibility. Uh, there was a beautiful Hungarian short film which I love and which in my view is the metaphor for all this situation. This is a story of a girl who goes to a new school and the, in the school they have this very famous horror. So they're singing and so on and she's very much uh, uh, excited to be there. It's called Sing, in the film. Uh, and she was allowed to enter but because she was not very talented, the teacher asked her simply to open her mouth because she's going to be on the stage, but she should not spoil, basically, uh, the quality of the music. And in the film, basically, her best friend understands this. At the end of the day, everybody simply opens their mouths because they show that everybody has the right to sing, even those who are not very gifted. Eastern Europe is slightly in this position. We have the feeling that when we enter the European Union, we're there, we're on the stage, but part of the message is just open your mouth. 
And then comes all these leaders and say, we want to sing. Unfortunately, some of our singing talent is slightly limited. And probably we're going to destroy the song. But I do believe this is quite important because if this is not going to happen, the resentment is going to go much deeper. And I, very, I do believe that we should have uh, a common social system which functions not on the level of one or the other member state, but on the level of the European Union. You want to add something? Well, no, just no, no, please, no. let's ask yes, of another. Very brief question. Based on all your analysis and, and obviously valid analysis, do you see any forces or option to reverse this trend and to strengthen liberal, the liberal order we have built up in Europe? So, so here comes a very strange source of optimism of mine. By the way, there is a major distinction between being an optimist and being hopeful. So I'm not going to define myself as an optimist, but I do believe that I'm hopeful and I'm going to give you a strange source of it. Uh, this strange source is Machiavelli. Machiavelli said, do you know what? Any government, any prince, nevertheless of what they're doing, for every prince there are good times and bad times. And you never can simply avoid the bad times. The problem is, have you managed to accumulate enough loyalty and goodwill in order to survive the bad times? And I do believe that the European Union has managed to accumulate quite a lot of positive feeling and loyalty on the side of citizens. Plus, I don't see any very attractive alternatives. So I don't believe that there are going to be a new project. When people are saying that we're going to reinvent the European Union on the base of some big vision, I'm skeptical, I'll be happy. I don't see how this is going to happen, but I do believe that survival of a political project is a very important source of legitimacy. And I'm going in front of this audience, being a Bulgarian, to give an uh, example which probably is going to be controversial because you all know more about this than me. But the story is, now everybody is fascinated how the Habsburg Empire collapsed. But the interesting question about the empire is not that it collapsed, but why it didn't collapse much earlier. If you are basically reading, and this is true not only for them, it's true for the Ottoman Empire, which I know better. Uh, the story is that survival, the very fact that basically you manage to find a way to recover after one crisis or another crisis, makes people believe that you should look for the solution of your problems in the framework of this political project. And from this point of view, European Union didn't do great things concerning the financial crisis, but the fact that we have economic recovery now, the fact that some of the countries are doing better, convince people during the next crisis to think about solving it in the context of the European Union and not in the context of leaving the Union. And my second uh, source of optimism is that those who decided to do the opposite are not overperforming. It's very difficult to understand uh, uh, to what extent the success of Macron, but even to a certain extent the re-elections of the Chancellor Merkel, is not connected to the Trump effect and the Brexit effect. Because you see that somebody decided to make a different decision, I mean the Brits. A very serious state, very old democracy, basically nobody can be disrespectful for them, and people voted and they make their decision and then you see that nobody knows what to happen. And Britain is not happier than it was, much more confused. All the questions are back. And people look around and say, do we really know, want this? From this point of view, Macron and you asking was an important moment. Uh, there were people, for example, uh, here in Europe, there was Stephen Bannon very much in the United States, who believes that a new revolution has started. It's a very strong anti-liberal, anti-globalist revolution. It's go from country to country, and now it was US, it was Brexit, and now this is going to move to France, this is going to move to Germany. But this was slightly the thinking of the Bolsheviks in the 1918, 1919, that Germany is next, and probably Hungary comes, and so on. People were scared of what they saw. They are afraid that they are not going to go this way, and paradoxically, Trump really contributed to the success of Macron. 
in my view, he contributed to the success of, uh, of the Chancellor. So, and this survival matters, because the crisis, some of the structural issues are still there, but the major question is, are we going to solve them in European framework? or are we going basically to try totally to nationalize the solution? And this is the source of my hopefulness. Probably it's not strong enough as having a vision how it's going to happen, but this is very funny with these books. When you write a book and giving an analysis and people said, but give us the solution. And you know, when people are giving the solution, this is the 10 unreadable parts of the book. Because people are telling you something that they know, and then in the next 10, pages, they're giving you the banality that even they don't believe. I don't know how it's going to work. I don't believe that European Union is doomed. This is different. I also don't believe that necessary European Union is going to survive. It's open, but everything politically is open, and probably it's not so bad. Uh, go on on this, on this question. Uh, you mentioned before the danger of a breakdown of the rule-based international order because of US and China and Russia and other factors. Can a rule-based system like the European Union survive as an island in a rule-less world? Listen, if North Korea managed to survive for 25 years in a liberal world, probably European Union also has a chance to survive in a illiberal world. But of course, what is going to change, and this change, by the way, is already there, is the following. Five years ago, the question which Europeans were asking themselves was how we can transform the world around us. Now the question is different. How not to allow the world around us to transform us? So from this point of view, European Union is becoming much more protectionist, not in economic terms, but very much we are looking at ourselves as an exception and not as the model of the world to come. Uh, and I always believe that the major radical changes is not when you're starting to give a different answer to the old question, but when a new question comes. And I do believe we are with the new question. Is this going to change European Union? For sure. But listen, European Union has been changing also for the last 30, 40, 50 years. There was a famous book in, uh, in political science called Rescuing the European Nation State, Alan Millard. And Alan Millard was showing that people who made the European Union were very much national-minded politicians, for good reasons. So you have Adenauer and De Gaulle and so on. So for them, European Union was not the way to overcome the nation state, but it was the way to re-legitimize the nation state. But the process started to develop differently. The paradox now is that European political elites are much more European than they have been before, but they're pushing for much more national solution because of the nature of the crisis that they find. And I do believe we're going to look for a new balance. I do believe that this balance is going to be found politically. It's going to, defined, to be defined much more by events than by the papers which Mr. Juncker is uh, uh, writing. Uh, but, but politics was always like this. From this point of view, I do believe that what we are seeing is the return of politics, and the return of politics has its nasty face too. But remember, 10 years ago, very smart people saying consensual politics is unbearable. We want a real politics. We want a distinction. We want to know who is who. And now, you know, there are much starker and sharper choices than before. We should enjoy it. Well, we should enjoy, we should enjoy it. It's a wonderful final word for after this hour of enjoy. Enjoyable conversation. Thank you very much, Ivan Kastev, and thank you for your interest and for your attention.